Um, welcome back to our uh, session, uh, the academic session on Thursday. Our next speaker is Jessica Moll, um, I think I'm pronouncing correctly, uh, from the Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory. Um, Jessica is uh, a research scientist in the Human Geography Group, and she specializes on uh, spatial data analysis and modeling and um, data fusion. Uh, she uses these techniques to combine and analyze large volumes of data uh, to facilitate high resolution population distribution uh, modeling for LandScan USA and LandScan HD. Welcome, Jessica. Um, I'm going to let you, uh, I'm going to add your presentation as well to the stream and I'm going to let you present. <laughs> I think you are muted. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm... Okay. Um, so we're good now. You can hear. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, like Christina said, I am Jessica Mole. I am at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is in uh, Tennessee, uh, which anytime I go to an international conference, everybody is like, oh, Jack Daniels. So yes, that, that Tennessee. Um, but I wanted to talk to everybody about our uh, vector analytical framework that uh, we use for population modeling. Um, so it is... Um, It is uh, something that we have been using here for our uh, gridded population modeling. Um, and this presentation is about uh, LandScan USA, and, and that's what we developed this framework for and, um, and where we're using it extensively right now. We've been, been doing it for a few years now uh, that we use it. So I'm going to give you a background on what LandScan USA is. It is a gridded daytime and nighttime population estimate. It's a three arc second resolution raster data set. So there's a daytime raster and a nighttime raster. You can see uh, in San Francisco uh, on the right hand side, there is a uh, big difference in that population uh, day and night uh, in the downtown area. So these gridded data sets are used by the US government. Uh, this is a foundation level data set that is funded by the government uh, for uh, planning and uh, response, so resiliency, emergency readiness and response, uh, and recovery efforts as well. Uh, and we build this with another data set uh, that's an ORNL produced FEMA funded building footprint layer. Uh, it's called USA Structures. Um, we also use the uh, high field critical infrastructure layers um, for some of our component models like uh, schools, uh, prisons, things like that. Um, and uh, we also have commercial parcel data that is, is being used here. And those are, are the big data sets that, that we're using. And uh, the map kind of in the middle of the screen here is dot density population uh, in the buildings that we have uh, that we're using. Underneath these gridded raster uh, data sets, we've started modeling at the building level. And we can start making these uh, cool maps of, of dot density population. So we're, we're pretty excited about it and uh, wanted to share um, share the, the guts of what we've been doing here. So uh, just some background on uh, disymmetric aggregation, disaggregation, aerial interpolation. I've, I've seen a couple other talks here at, at the meeting uh, about disymmetric uh, modeling. So it's, it's something that is definitely being used outside of, of our group. But uh, the, the concept is essentially taking the source zone uh, known population. So a lot of times this is an aggregate number uh, from like a census uh, in the country. But we have a source zone in this example uh, that is workers. We know that there are 90 workers in the census, census track, and we're trying to map those down to the grid cells on the right-hand side. Uh, and you could use something like just straight proportional uh, population to those uh, building footprint areas, uh, and you'd get um, the top right model. Uh, or you could do something like uh, multi-class asymmetric method, where you include something like a parcel uh, land use classification, um, where it says, hey, this building's commercial. And then you, as the experts say, we only want to put workers in commercial buildings, not residential. And then you get something uh, like the bottom right, where no population ends up in the residential. Uh, so that's the basic outputs of the models that that we're running uh, is this, this method. Um, so 
we have been doing this, uh, you know, even before my time here at, at Oak Ridge. Um, and we still use this in, in some other population models, not, not with Lansky and USA anymore, um, but we have a raster processing workflow and that's always been the faster way to do it um, than a vector method, but that's getting less so. And that's kind of where we got to when we decided to build this framework. Um, so you, the base element that we have is uh, this building footprints um, that are extracted from roughly one meter imagery. Um, and we take that, aggregate it to a five meter resolution, and you've got this one to 25 uh, value raster. And um, then any other data sets you wanna use, so parcels, the schools that I talked about, uh, census boundaries, you have to grid all of those, you know, rasterize those uh, on whatever value it is. And then you get this big stack of rasters that are all at that same resolution uh, and, and are aligned. And it's really difficult to think of those little slices as, um, you know, coming together as a building. You know, you're not really modeling at a building level, you're modeling at, you know, that cell level. So this, uh, you know, thinking about um, modeling at the building level was you know, where we were. So just to show you the, the limitations of, you know, rasterizing something um, to the parcel data, very rich data source, you know, tons of attributions, uh, land use um, is a, a primary use, you know, super useful one, uh, you know, different, but there are tons of variables there that, that are gonna be super useful. Um, but if you rasterize that, you know, you've got to rasterize it for every variable that you want to use, you would have to have a separate raster layer um, uh, to use in, in that raster model uh, processing. And, you know, when you rasterize something like this one, you know, you can't link back from that original raster necessarily to all those other attributes. Uh, you also get, you know, the, some of those parcels are really small. How do you, you know, how do you, pick which one rasterizes. There are lots of uh, problems with this um, method. So uh, just to show you some of the, you know, the data that's moving underneath us this time, this whole time uh, as well is, you know, we've got these um, NAEP imagery based. Uh, so that's a US government um, standardized data set of imagery for every state. Um, you know, we have a, a CNN convolutional neural network output uh, building extraction from that. Um, but we have a subsequent uh, method here with that USA structures data set that is um, regularized. And you can see uh, some of the, the ones on the left hand side are kind of, you know, ooze together and you get um, you know, some of those buildings come together. So we're, we're seeing improvements in these input data sets happening underneath us. Uh, so, so we really wanted to be able to, to build our population modeling framework um, so that we're getting better uh, as well. Just to give you an understanding of the impact and the scale that we're, we're processing here, um, the result of this framework for the United States is 270 million plus rows of building parts. So um, we've taken those 123 odd uh, US structures buildings and run them through the framework with 150 million or 152 million parcel polygons, 11 million census blocks, and uh, it, it ends up being 65 million unique grid cells uh, that are also embedded. Um, well, it's, it's actually a whole lot more than that uh, at, a, at that three arc second resolution that get generated. Um, but all of this is stored and calculated inside of PostGIS. Um, and in terms of impact for how um, we've seen this be super useful is it has changed how we uh, can think about and prioritize what we want to uh, do in our models because we move the heavier computation all the way to the front of, of what we're doing. Um, you, know, you take all of the data that you have, you run them through. Now you have building parts. You have no loss of information uh, at that point. So, uh, you know, every polygon that we have is uniquely informed 
uh, or evenly informed. So you can always link back to the original data sets. So any questions that we want to ask of this data, it's really easy to get to an answer. Uh, where in that raster-based workflow, the heaviest computation is right near the very end. And you know, you, you're dealing, we were dealing with these five meter rasters uh, that might be huge. And um, yeah, I can remember working on Texas in that five meter raster and it was, yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of data and you know, you can cube those up, but it's still um, quite a bit, you know, so if you want to iterate, you know, you want to do something different on one of your other data sets, uh, you, know, you got to regrid all of those things. Um, so this vector framework, those 270 million rows uh, become the basis of all of our other workflows. Um, so things that we do with that are handle overlap, and I'll show an example of that later. Um, interpreting any confounding land use information. Uh, this is something that you know, just becomes so so easy to, to do um, when you have that data table. You basically have taken away uh, a lot of the spatial parts of it. You're now in a statistical analysis framework, so 270 million rows is not, not terribly uh, slow to compute. Um, some other things we do is impute nulls. Um, and then you know, doing zonal stats is uh, super easy um, in this because you've embedded all of that information that you need uh, to get any summaries that you need. So um, I want to walk through the processing scenario that we have uh, kind of landed on. Um, and it's all in Everything's already in Postgres, PostGIS. That's, you know, we were doing that before, uh, and that's kind of how we got to, to being like, well, you know, it's everything's pretty fast. Indexes are great. Uh, let's, let's process in Postgres as well. Um, so in the scenario that I'm gonna show you, we've got census blocks, we've got parcels, we have grid lines, and you could really use any other data sets that you want. Um, yeah, I mentioned schools, you know, so we, ha we have some school boundary polygons or college boundaries. Uh, prisons is another one. So any of these things that you want to to throw in um, um, and that you might want to aggregate back to later, uh, you can throw in at this point. So the very uh, you know first, second step, you throw all those things in. So step two here is uh, you union all of the polygons in each of those layers and dump them, dump the lines. Um, so interior rings and exterior rings um, and uh, we figured out um, you know, through these different iterations that throwing the ST subdivide in at this point is really helpful. I think that we split it at like 10, 10 vertices. So you know, post, Postgres, PostGIS uh, is gonna churn through rows really quickly. Um, so if you can make your geometry simpler, uh, it's gonna be beneficial. Um, so uh, moving along to the next step here, um, we, uh, so I don't know if, if you guys have used ST split or anything like that, but if you have multiple polygons and you split another polygon, you're going to get duplicate records on that building. Like, so if you took a building and split it by two of these parcels, parcel A and parcel B, you would get back, um, each side of that split line multiple times. So you get duplicates. So we, uh, to get around this issue, that's, that's why we built that blade layer first. And then we linked up all of the blades that intersect the building and we union all of those. So then you get this nice cookie cutter action and uh, it's set up to be, you know, just a row for each, uh, you know, building geometry, a blade geometry that's confined to just that. And then it's really easy to burn through a bunch of rows of that. Um, and so step four, you have a table now, so that building one in this example has been split into 10 rows, and building two didn't get split by anything, so it doesn't automatically show up in that table. So we join it back in here. Um, so then all of the, you know, it, it's a building part, it's just the whole part. Uh, and, and that happens quite frequently, especially if you don't have something like the grid lines in there. So. Uh, when you run this without all of those extra grid lines, which we we only need because our output is in that gridded row column, uh, 
and that you know three arc second grid so we burn that in here um, but a lot of times you you do have buildings that are fully within all of uh, all of your other zone data so <coughs> in this step we uh, actually create a point within um, it's either the centroid or an ST point on surface and then we join back the census data, the parcel data, the building ID, and then we have the row and column uh, that are also generated off of that. So then you have this table um, that has all of the geometries that you need. You know, sometimes you might just need a point. Sometimes you might need that full geometry to calculate area, for example. That's something that that we will use. Um, and then you have like the parcel information that you can join back now easily in Postgres to grab uh, any other information on that data set. <coughs> Apologies on the, the coughing here. And so this is a, a real world example um, of a shopping center in East Tennessee. And that building is uh, split into four when you just split it with parcels. Um, so this is a Walmart, which is a uh, which is a big box discount store in the United States. And then uh, it splits into 29 different building parts when you uh, include the grid blade. And they're, the highlighted in yellow uh, record is down on that left-hand side. So you can see that we're storing these things like with a unique ID, the building ID, uh, census block, uh, the parcel ID, since we actually use an array here, so you can have multiple values. Um, and that is helpful when we have that overlap that I was talking about, the land uses, um, you know, when you're getting those from, you know, maybe multiple parcels or from another data set, even you could aggregate into that. Uh, we got the area calculated for each of these parts and uh, the point and polygon geometry columns, because you can store both of those in Postgres in the same uh, in the same table, which is super great, and the grid row and column. Um, so is this overkill? Uh, you know, it, it might seem like it, you know, a lot of spatial analysis, you would just do a, a centroid uh, of the building and join it. And, you know, you can look at this example. So if you made a centroid of this building and joined it to the parcels, you know, it, it intersects four parcels. Um, you know, so, so which one of these land uses are you going to get? Which one of the parcels are you going to assign this building to? Uh, so you know, there are obviously some cases where, um, where that centroid is insufficient. Um, you know, there are plenty of places, you know, most, most buildings are going to be single family residential. They are going to fall within, um, fully within a, a parcel. It's going to be sufficient to do a centroid on those types of things. Um, but you can't really measure that unless you've split everything up. Um, so, uh, and as an example, to try to quantify kind of how much uh, of that happens, we calculated the building parts to building ratio, and this is excluding that grid line. So this would, this would be the four buildings, building parts uh, to the one building ratio uh, for this graph. Um, a lot of places like in New York, um, you know, as this chart goes up on the, on the bottom axis, you see the Queens County, New York was three something. And I have an example of that one, uh, on the next slide, but it's, you know, very clear that in, you know, at the County scale, even a lot of these are, and would be really insufficient to use a centroid. Um, so just to bring that home, the 38, uh, buildings in this tract, uh, in, in Queens, New York, um, get split into 492 parts uh, just when you're splitting by parcels. So there's, you know, what, 10 or 15 different land uses there. A lot of them are, are getting, uh, would not be uh, getting mapped uh, if you did just a centroid join here. Uh, and then if you were rasterizing this, you're gonna get some distortion in the relative distributions of land use. Uh, you're gonna lose some of those land uses when you do that in a raster. And, this vector and a local frame, framework just lets us keep all of that information. Um, and you don't have to make any of those decisions. Uh, so in terms of processing time, it's not exactly linear. Um, you know, you have a lot of, 
you know, Postgres's query engine uh, is going to, you know, puts a lot of emphasis into rows, um, and the weights have gotten a ton better on the PostGIS uh, side, you know, actually uh, helping the, the query engine cost some of those queries uh, a lot better now. Uh, you know, so that's another thing about having it written, written in SQL as as Postgres and PostGIS are getting better, our code doesn't have to change and we're getting speed increases underneath. Um, but, you know, states with larger extents or more population, which is seen in more blocks uh, and more parcels, those places are, are gonna be computationally more uh, expensive than uh, small, small sparsely populated places. But there is a, a fairly uh, good linear relationship. So, uh, and, and like I talked about earlier, you know, any of this heavy processing we do is upfront and not at the end. And that's one of the biggest advantages. So, you know, our machine here is pretty big with 128 cores. And that just lets us you know, spin out and throw several states at it at once. Um, you know, tons of RAM. So you're not falling over to, to slower mediums. Um, you know, we've run this in a lot uh, more constrained environment. Uh, as well, and it just you know you you can throw less at it, so it's not it's not like it takes all of that to run uh, one thing. Um, so we have uh, those building outlines, the parcel data, and the census data sets that are are uh, the bulk uh, data sets there, and then the three arc second grid line blade is is pretty big as well. Um, so just to talk about some of the applications that I talked about. So things that we can get into and dig into in, in the problem space so much better um, because we have uh, the data the way that we do. Um, so when you think about overlap in a data set, like a parcel data set, sometimes this is gonna be real. So you have a condo, uh, a condominium in the United States is, uh, you know, a small, building that's owned by the people, but then the land is owned by somebody else. So you get some, some occasions where the parcels overlap and that's a real occurrence. Sometimes you might have two parcels that overlap each other on the edge uh, just because the topology isn't good. Um, and that would be like a misalignment error. So if you're trying to fix or understand overlap just in isolation of that layer, you know, you're going to deal with all of those cases and try to figure out um, what that overlap means in your model. And sometimes it might not matter at all to your model. You know, if the two edges of your polygons are overlapping, you know, now you're trying to think about that overlap, but they're not running into the building at all. Um, you know, so there are lots of occasions where having all of that information together um, keeps you from having to deal with problems. Um, but so in the in Washington, D.C., 16% of the building area uh, had multiple parcels um, that were overlapping it. So this is a, a fairly big problem in some places. In the state of Indiana, much more rural agricultural state, there was very little overlap. Uh, Oregon, uh, for some reason, seems to have a lot. Um, but, you know, because we have no information loss, we can iteratively go through and test and make different decisions. So one decision we might make in that condo example is, you know, if the land use on the condo is residential, but then the land around it is a much bigger polygon and it's commercial because a property management company owns it, um, you know, we can implement a rule that says, hey, give us the land use of the smallest parcel, you know, and, or we could say, give us the land use that is residential. And you can implement those different decisions and iterate through, see what happens when you uh, populate places with those different rules. And um, it's so much easier to work through some of those, come up with the best solution instead of what's your intuitive answer. And now let's generate that. So, you know, it took a minute or so to calculate over those 270 million records uh, at the tract, at the county, at the state. You know, you can really start quantifying these things. Uh, very easily. Um, another example is uh, something that seems easy to think about, but isn't, especially when you think about it in 
how you would do it in a raster framework. You know, we've, we solved this problem in a raster uh, modeling environment. It's much more difficult to implement, think about, explain. Um, in this case is where we have a college, we have another college that also occupies part of that campus. So one of these buildings, uh, the darker green, maybe it's a little hard to see, is you know, sharing college students. We don't think it's dense, we don't think it's populated twice, you know, it's not as, it's not like it's twice as dense. Um, so with this framework, it's really easy to say, hey, this building shows up in multiple colleges. Let's reduce the densities for each of those colleges uh, so that we're not overpopulating this building. Um, so just in conclusion, um, you know, we're using this for population modeling, but we really think that that uh, vector framework uh, is extensible to other problems. Um, you know, it's really been cool to have all our data in Postgres, uh, in PostGIS, and then also processing there. Um, we think that, you know, this type of thing is a similar processing workflow, uh, but not at the scale uh, that, that most people are, are used to dealing with. And I think that having your data in kind of this more traditional data science structure um, brings in a lot of new and better techniques for that. Um, so with that, I will uh, take any questions that you have. Um, Thank you, Jessica. Uh, very nice presentation, very interesting data set that you're building there. Um, let's just uh, go towards the, the questions, um, see uh, if our audience has any. Um, might remind you that um, you can probably contact uh, Jessica on her email um, that I, I put on the banner. Um, if you have uh, any additional questions that uh, can't be answered during this session, we still have a couple of minutes to to, to take some. Um, so please go to the questions tab and try to. Um, okay, so we 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 have our first um, question: um, Is the pipeline open source? Um, we don't have. We haven't released the code yet. Um, but I mean, that's something that we're interested in doing. It's it's all written in SQL, though. It's um, it's pretty straightforward uh, SQL code. So, um, but we have to go through an internal review process for releasing code, which is fun. Um, so we can work through doing that. Uh, but but the method uh, at least is uh, hopefully interpretable pretty well. Um, but no, not not right now. Um, the data set, uh, the final, the Polygon data set isn't, but the raster data set uh, is, um, is open and can be accessed. And all of those links are in the paper that, that accompanies uh, as well. So the building, the, bu the building footprint data is, is also open. Uh, and there, there are citations there in that uh, paper as well. Um, thank you, Jessica. We have yeah. another uh, question for you. Um, okay. Have you ever come across a case of disaggregating population on segments of street networks? Or do you have any suggestions based on that? Um, I have a uh, colleague at uh, Oak Ridge, uh, James uh, Gabordi, uh, who, who I believe has done uh, a lot of that. So he's actually just joined us at the lab recently. So I have not done that directly, but uh, that is um, something that I'm familiar with. And I think, you know, is something that could be done in this framework as well. Um, how is your tool different than US EPA uh, day symmetric mapping tool? Um, I'm not I'm sure. Try. I'm not sure, I'm not directly familiar with that. I mean the the dysmetric part is is not really any different. I mean, you know, you're yeah, you know, the weights and things are are not um, what we're talking about here um, per se. Like this is this is just about creating that data set to do that analysis. Um, you know, there there are lots of variables that are 
are unique to each and every day's metric mapping technique that gets used. Um, so, because all of that is all all of that is heavily dependent on whatever ancillary data you have. So, I think I think that that's um, the best answer I have for that. Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, if there are any questions uh, left, uh, we have to proceed to the next speaker. Jessica, thank you for coming. For, thank you for presenting um, and hope you have a nice, uh, wonderful Phosphor G. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.